Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. This is Pastor Jan um, from her home with her husband, Mike Osminski, or maybe you know him as Pastor Oz. Um, we are continuing to um, give the word from home until we feel that it is safe for us to all congregate again back in the building. So just stay tuned to your uh, uh, your computer, whatever you're watching us from, and we will let you know, we promise, when the building will be open. Okay, um, let me just open with a quick word of prayer, and then I'll tell you what we're going to do today. Dear Jesus, thank you again for allowing us to get the message out, allowing people to hear the Word of God, uh, and thanking you, Lord, for making technology available to all of us, Lord, that we can still be together. Even though we're not in the flesh with each other, we're definitely in the spirit via technology. So thank you, dear Jesus. Thank you so much. Okay, our psalm today is Psalm 83. So if you want to turn to that psalm. And again, I think it's very interesting. It's not one of the more popular ones. But when I shared it with my husband, he gets excited. And then maybe that excitement gets me to reread it and get excited too. So I'm going to read it, give a short word, a couple words about it. And then we're going to go on and talk about a very famous man who did a lot for this country. And that's another man beside Jesus. Okay. Okay. Psalm 83. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace. And do not be still, O God, for behold, your enemies make a, a turmoil, and those who hate you have lifted up their head, and they have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. You know, and I just want to interject there so many times, and I heard this from so many people, myself included, that God is silent. We cry out. And we don't hear an answer. We don't hear anything. It's as if our our prayers are going to a, a ceiling and they're bouncing back down. So this person obviously is feeling the same way. That God, he's not hearing God. He's not feeling God. So let's continue. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation. That the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and Ishmaelites, Moab and Hagrites, Gebel, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia and the inhabitants, and inhabitants of Tyre. Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. So here we have all these nations ganging up on Israel, all these nations coming together against Israel. And Israel's crying out, Lord, help us, hear us. And there's no reply. Deal with them as with Midian, as with Caesarea, Caesarea as with Jabin at the brook Kishon, who perished at Endor, who became as a refuge on the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb. Yes, all the princes like Zeba, and Zalmunna, who said, Let us take for ourselves the pastures of God for a possession. Oh my God, make them like the whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind, as the fire burns the woods, as the flame sets the mountains on fire. So pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Let them be put to shame and perish, that they may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the Most High over all the earth. You know, I was talking to my husband about this. I just wanted to make sure I could pronounce all the names correctly. And then he showed me, he had sent out a text about it. 
and I thought it was worth mentioning. He said that, you know, when God is silent, maybe it's because he's working. Maybe it's because he's doing something. Not maybe, he is. And so maybe we don't see what he's doing. Maybe we don't even have any inkling what he's doing, but he's working behind the scenes. So I think this is a psalm of hope. It's a psalm of, of to give us faith that even though the heavens may seem silent sometimes, God is at work. So, and I think uh, there's also a lot of things in this text that um, really, as a nation, we can align with. We can feel what's going on in our own country, what, what's going on. And this really goes with what I want to talk about today. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, tomorrow we celebrate him. Um, some people ask why in January. Well, he was born in January. And actually January 15th. So, and if he would have lived, he would have been 92. And that's that's pretty amazing. He died when he was 39. Um, so he's been gone a long time. He represented to so many people... Um, a nonviolent approach to protesting, a nonviolent approach to um, fight for civil rights for all men and women and children in our nation. It was his, his desire to see everyone free. And he did it in a, in a way, in a model that we should all copy. Um, when he gave his speech, I have a dream. It was on August 28th, 1968. It started, um, people filled in at the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, because in a way he was honoring Abraham Lincoln. Went down the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. It went down, um, um, I have to remember where it went down. It went down um, into the National Mall and then around the reflecting flood, uh, pool and then out. There were a quarter million people there, 250,000 people there. I want you to think about that. And there, were, there was no violence. It was up to that point the largest gathering of people in our country protesting peacefully, and that's amazing. To me, that's just amazing. He was a Christian minister, a Baptist minister. His father was a Baptist minister. His grandfather was a Baptist minister, so it was definitely in his lineage. I happened to look up. I know his one daughter. He had four children, two girls and two boys. His one daughter died um, uh, in her 50s, but the other daughter that's alive is also a minister, so it's in their blood. It's in their blood. It's something they can't deny. So I'm, I want to read to you the full speech. You know, we've heard a phrase for so long. But have we read the whole speech? Have we heard the whole speech? And I'm going to read it. And you know, I read it yesterday. And I actually was crying. Um, I think it's very moving. The other thing I want to bring up, he was extremely intelligent. He graduated from college at the age of 19. Uh, with his bachelor's, and then he went on to get his uh, doctorate. And he loved words. And you can tell in this speech, he loved words, and he would study words. And um, he definitely was a wordsmith. Some of the words I was like, whoa, that's interesting. Okay, so here we go. Five score years ago, a great American, in whose symbolic shadow we stand today, signed, the Emancipation Proclamation. This monumentous decree came as a great beacon of light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering justice. injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro is still not free. One hundred years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty 
in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. One hundred years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself an exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promis promissory note, and in so far as her citizens of color are concerned, instead of honoring this sacred obligation, Mary has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of, of the opportunity of this nation. And so we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We've also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tran tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. The sweltering summer of the Negro's legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end but a beginning. And those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will not be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. And there will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizen, citizen rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But there is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisf satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protests to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. The marvelous new mili militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people for many of our white brothers as evidenced by their presence here today they have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny and they have come to realize that their freedom is inex inextricably bound to our freedom we cannot walk alone and as we march we must have the pledge that we shall always march ahead we cannot turn back. And those, there are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? 
We may never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways, in the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied, and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells, and some of you have come from areas where your quest, quest for freedom, left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. Go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, and so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, with its vicious racist, with this governor having his lip dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and, and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall, shall see it together. And this is our hope, and this is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful sympathy, sym symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. And this will be the day, this will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. 
Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the uh, curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from the Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from the Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and molehill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens and when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Well, I'm not going to really make any comments about what he said. I, I, I think that if you're interested, you can Google his speech and read it again. He has a lot in there. And um, I think that we should really take it to heart. I think we should shame on um, our country if there's still injustice going on. He wrote that he gave the speech in 1968. Shame on our country if we are um, not following God, but following a man. Be careful, saints. Be careful. Jesus is who we follow. Jesus is who we follow, not a man. And some people have taken into their own hands to settle this through violence. And that's not what we do as Christians. Jesus told us to turn the other cheek. If, if you want to know how, how Jesus would feel about violence, just read in the Gospels. He's made it very clear. So anyway, I just want to stop with that. I think it's powerful. I think it's very powerful. Uh, everything he said, uh, we need to go before God and ask ourselves, is there any area in our lives where I'm still guilty of these things? So we're going to partake in our communion now. So you need to get your elements. And I'm going to start with the bread. Thank you. So, dear Lord, listening to the words of Martin Luther King Jr., it brought sadness to my heart that we still see injustice in this land. We still see mistreatment of people of color. It's still not an even playing board for them. We still see violence in our country, even though, you know, uh, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. asked for a nonviolent approach to protesting. Lord, help us, dear God, to see you in the midst of all the turmoil that's going on in this country and let your people show others, dear God, how you would handle it. And your handling it was you gave up your life for others. Are we willing to do that? Thank you for the blood, blood in Jesus' name. Amen. And Lord, really your example, giving up your life, it's remarkable. Do you know that Martin Luther King also said he knew he would give up his life for this cause? He knew he was going to be killed. He knew it, but he, it didn't stop him. How many of us would do that? How many of us would lay down our lives at 39 years old? That's remarkable. So dear Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. who didn't didn't want to die, didn't want to leave his wife and four children, but knew that there was a cost to be paid and he was willing to pay it. I thank you, Lord, for men like him. I thank you, God, for a God like you who is always working. It might be silently. We may not always see your hand, but you're always there. You never sleep. You never stop. So God, may we, rather than taking this unheaval that's going on in this country into our own hands, may we have the spirit of peace on us, the spirit of peace that you had 
even as you approach the cross. Give us that peace in this hour, dear God, that we would not lash out at each other. We would not call each other names. And I'm talking about Christians to Christians. That is shameful. That is so shameful. So dear God, in this hour, I pray that we may see you even when we can't see you, Lord. We may hear you even when you're not speaking. Lord, give us the senses, dear God, to always know you are always with us. In Jesus' name, thank you for the blood. Well, have a blessed day. I'm anxious to hear what's going to be shared. Um, and uh, I'm going to leave. And thank you for listening to me. Good morning, brethren. What I would like to do is turn to Psalm 82. Let me get myself there as well. Uh, Jan read 83, which was our psalm for today. I want to look at 82, which was the psalm yesterday. We are actually in a series of 11 psalms we concluded today. Psalm 73 through Psalm 83 are the psalms of Asaph. And we'll look at the significance of the psalms of Asaph today. We started last week looking at uh, simply Psalm 73, but I, I want to go to Psalm 82. Um, Psalm 82, right at the end of this series of 11 Psalms by Asaph, a prophetic worshiper, deals with this issue of justice. Not only are we... Um, looking toward uh, the national holiday dedicated to Martin uh, Luther King Jr. And, and Jan obviously just addressed his prophetic words that he spoke 50 some years ago. But we also are celebrating today sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Dr. King spoke of justice for the poor, for the oppressed. He referred to justice, quoting Amos from the Old Testament and the Old Testament categories of those who represented the primary focus of justice from leaders and kings elected officials, the poor, the vulnerable, the broken, the oppressed, widows, orphans, people seeking asylum in our country from nations where they're being oppressed. He addressed justice toward that group and the sanctity of life, Human Sunday, addresses justice toward the unborn whose lives are taken from them, violently taken from them in abortion. Psalm 82 is about justice. Psalm 82 starts this way. God has taken his place in the heavenly council, in the divine council, in the council of God. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And if you remember, several weeks back when we spoke of the prophetic significance of government, we said that Psalm 82 is referring to what Paul refers to in Romans 13. Uh, most translations translate it rulers and authorities, but it's, it's in the Greek, it's powers and principalities. And it's the same word that Paul uses in Ephesians 6 when we talk about spiritual warfare with powers and principalities. This is not simply an Old Testament concept. People uh, use that terminology to disqualify biblical theology. Jesus drew his teaching about the gospel and the kingdom of God from the Old Testament. Paul drew his teaching about justification by faith from 
the Old Testament. Acts drew its 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 understanding of of the the narrative of of kingdom history of of gospel eschatology from the Old Testament. Book of Revelation, of course, prophesies the future of church history, human history from the Old Testament. Psalm 82 says that there are powers and principalities. The Lord puts in place supernatural entities. We might want to equate them with the 24 elders in the book of Revelation. Those are supernatural beings. Elders speak of rule. Elders speak of judgment. Elders speak of government. They they surround the throne of God and the Lord, as the book of Daniel calls them, princes, gives Persia a prince and Greece a prince, Rome a prince, Babylon a prince, America a prince. These are principalities and powers that help human rulers and human governments to carry out God's will in the earth. But he starts Psalm 82, he addresses the powers and principalities, uh, but then he, he, he moves right from there in verse 2 to the earthly rulers who represent those powers and principalities to bring the various nations of the earth into their divine purposes for their existence. We also talk about Acts 17. Paul speaks of this in the New Testament, that God has plans and purposes for nations. God has a plan and a purpose for the nation of America. I believe that much of that plan and purpose, it gets manifested on a human level in the human documents that establish legal precedence for a nation. So we'll make reference to the U.S. Constitution. Is the U.S. Constitution of God? Yes, it is, as as much as the Constitution of Israel is of God, or of Russia is of God, or of China is of God, or of South Africa is of God. It speaks of God's intentions for a nation. So first of all, the Lord speaks that he's going to hold judgment in the midst of the heavenly council where these powers and principalities have gathered. And then he goes right into the human sphere. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? This is now human rulers who are... uh, these these powers and principalities are behind to give authority and, and to give a moral structure to the purpose for which that nation has been raised up by God. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? And here's the issue of justice. Justice for the unborn, justice for the vulnerable, justice for the people of a nation. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. That's that's God speaking justice. And, and we speak that justice today, both in light of what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke years ago and what the sanctity of Human Life Sunday represents for the unborn. I commented on this psalm some months ago. Psalm 82 reminds us that one of the chief factors in becoming holy is the practice of justice. We're in the third book of Psalms, the Leviticus book, and that Leviticus in the Torah deals with holiness. Psalm 82 reminds us that one of the chief factors in becoming holy is the practice of justice. The Lord is saying to the assembly of the gods or the divine council in verse 1 of this psalm that he is the ultimate source of justice and that the judges, rulers, and nations of the earth must conform to his justice or be judged himself. Now, there, there, there are all kinds of ideas about justice. America talks about justice. The nations of the earth talk about justice. We're talking about biblical justice. We're not talking about what the right wing deems is just or what the left wing deems is just, though, though, though there may be aspects that they're speaking truly. 
but we're talking about biblical justice. We're talking about the justice that comes from the Lord and the Lord determines what is just and unjust. But he holds the nations not to the standards of their concept of justice. He holds the nations accountable to his concept of justice. People ask, what was the purpose of the nation of Israel? It's to show how God deals with a nation. Now there's a, there's a, there's a spiritual dimension to Israel that shows how God is in relationship with his covenant people, but there's a, a national or governmental or worldly aspect to the nation of Israel. This is what God demands. I have people tell me, well, has any has America ever lived up to that justice? Uh, has any president or presidential candidate ever lived up to that justice? And my answer is, so what? Irrelevant. The year of Jubilee was never kept. It was never kept by Israel. We don't have any record of it being kept, but the Lord still judged them according to the principles of Jubilee. And because they didn't close their nation down for one year at a time, every 50 years, and did not do it once every seven years for the sabbatical years, the Lord finally added up and said, well, for 490 years, you haven't kept the year of Jubilee. That's 70 consecutive times you've violated my justice, so go on into exile. I'm removing you from the land for seven years, and, and we're going to catch up with the missing justice. So it's irrelevant. I mean, I bristle when people try to use that as an excuse to support a certain candidate or support a, a, a certain political agenda. I bristle at it. The Lord judges the nations according to his justice. Who are those that will determine the ultimate standing of a nation before the God of Psalm 82? The weak, the fatherless, the afflicted, the destitute, the broken, and the needy. And how justice is applied to them. Amen. Dr. King, your words are still true today. Amen, Sanctity of Life, Human Sunday. Your words are true. They were true in 1970 when abortion was legalized in this nation. They're true today. This is where the rationale for Matthew 25, 31 through 46 came from. When the Lord in Matthew 25 gathers Jesus, this is New Testament, gathers all the nations of the earth and judges them based on how they treated the least of my brethren. This is where that concept of justice from Psalm 82 is applied in our modern, current situation. Those who practice justice as a nation are sheep nations. Those who practice the opposite are goat nations. Father, we pray for America on the eve of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., it's national holiday. Lord, we pray for America on Sanctity of Life Human Sunday. Lord, we pray for America in the time leading up to the inauguration, the ina day of the inauguration, and the days following that. Lord God, may America become a sheep nation and not a goat nation. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. Now, let me say a big, big part of that, of America's becoming a sheep nation, will the prophetic voice of the church speak. Not the, 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 the false prophecy that's going forth right now. There's much false prophecy. But the prophetic word that echoes scripture, that echoes the gospel, that is a true embodiment of the Holy Spirit. This nation, like with Dr. King and like with what we celebrate today, the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, prophetic voices like that. Now, I'd like to conclude this discussion of Psalm 82 by pointing out some comments from Jewish commentaries on Psalm 82, which are very powerfully enlightening. 
and there, there, are, there are two comments to verse three. I read it, let's read it again. Verse three, give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Comment number one, this is, was addressed to the king who was the representative of the powers and principalities who themselves are supposed to be the representatives of God's justice in the earth. We also spoke that powers and principalities can go rogue and powers and principalities go rogue when they begin to demand worship for themselves. National idolatry, worshiping the nation instead of worshiping the Lord is a sign that powers and principalities have gone rogue. When powers and principalities seek to become religious, not political, they, they have political authority, they don't have authority in the religious realm, then they also, they're violating 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and political figures begin to put themselves in the place of God. They sit in the temple of God, showing themselves to be God, and 2 Thessalonians calls them lawless ones. And lawless ones are the wicked in the Old Testament, as verse 2 says. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? When powers and principalities, when nations, when leaders go rogue, they start showing partiality to the wicked, to the lawless. Verse four, rescue the weak and needy, deliver them from the hand of the lawless or the wicked. See, to remove justice from the vulnerable is lawlessness according to scripture. So verse three is, is addressed to the king, provide this justice. The king recognized that the protection of the poor and the orphan was his prime responsibility. The people of Israel were scattered throughout the land like sheep without a shepherd. When justice is not practiced, God's people are scattered like sheep without a shepherd. That will be appropriate to what Asaph is saying in Psalms 73 through 83. We'll, we'll hopefully see that today. And that was what Jesus himself said when he looked out and he saw the people scattered as sheep without shepherds. Jesus was saying, no justice in this land, not justice from the religious sector, the leaders of the Jews, and not justice from the political sector, the oppressive Roman government. Now, the Talmud also gives a quote on this verse three. Again, I'll, I'll, I just keep reading it because I want you to see this. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. The Talmud explains, David would execute strict justice and render a true decision even against a poor man. If a poor man violated the law, then David would mete out justice by not favoring the poor, no, not favoring the rich, but favoring God's justice. But here's what the Talmud says, then he, it continues. After he would render this true decision against the poor man, David would go to the poor man and of his own goods, David would supply the poor man provisions so he could meet his legal obligations. Justice to the poor. You failed. You deserve discipline and punishment, send the poor man away, and then David would run, and David would go and get everything the poor man needed to meet those obligations. My comment was, um, sounds a lot like Jesus. He rebukes us for our sin, and then he takes the penalty of our sin upon us. See, that's biblical justice. And there, there needs to be redemption. There needs to be redemption. The party that favors the wealthy at the expense of others is not walking in justice. The party that judges and condemns those who are in error and provides no redemption but only desires retribution 
is not walking in justice. See, the biblical justice is big. It's large. It punishes the lawbreakers, but it punishes it in a special way that watches out for the needs of the poor. It practices what the Lord does, a preference for the poor. Not a preference for the rich, a preference for the poor. And the party that demands retribution and punishment and grants no redemption also is not walking in justice. Verse six or verse five, a comment on verse five. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth is shaken. Judaism taught the three pillars upon which the earth rests are study of scripture, obedience to the commandments of the Lord, and justice. Those are the pillars that hold up the earth. We need to have the word of God central in our lives. We need to obey the word of God, and we need to walk in justice. Verse six, I said, you are gods, sons of the most high, all of you. This is the Lord speaking to earthly leaders. He calls earthly leaders the sons of God. They're the the earthly human manifestations of the divine council of the 24 elders, the powers and principalities. Verse six, although all men are fashioned in the image of God, the practitioner of justice, who is called a son of God, bears the closest likeness to the divine. All men are related to the creator, but the just judge, the righteous judge, the righteous ruler is as close as a son Because when he dispenses justice, he is acting as the Lord himself would act. Verse 8, which is the conclusion. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. When the Lord, when you, Lord, created the world, the Jews said, you took steps to prevent dissension, which might jeopardize the survival of human society. Biblically speaking, division, dissension, conflict, hostility threatens the very survival of human society on either side of the issue. Justice is the gift from God to bring about righteous relationships and unity apart from which the world cannot abide. The division in our country, I I wrote these words five months ago, true today, true five months ago, King's words, true 50 years ago, true today. The division in our country, the division in the church, and the insistence that what I see and what I only see is truth is leaving us terribly divided. I would call that sectarianism whether it's sectarian teaching in the church or sectarian practices as political parties rage against each other. This leaves us terribly divided and threatens the very stability of the earth and this nation. We must pray for the revelation of justice and the heart transformation justice brings to begin to be manifested in our midst. All right, now, back to Psalm 73. We looked at Psalm 73 last week. This is the, the this whole issue of the Lord's holiness. How does God formulate holiness in his church? Let's define holiness first of all. When we refer to the Lord's holiness, we are referring to his otherness. Holiness means God is separate. He's other. He's different from the rest of us. Of course, no president, no party uh, has ever perfectly manifested God's justice. That's why he's the holy one and we're not. 
He's the Holy One. He manifests his otherness. By that we mean he is like no other being in the universe. The universe and everything in it is created. He is the uncreated creator. We, his people, become holy as he grants us by his grace to become partakers of his divine nature, his holy purposes. By this process, the process of God sanctifying us, making us holy, we become dedicated to him and his holy purposes. Now, the Psalms of Asaph start in 73 and run through 83. They begin the third book, the Levitical book, and they run to close to the end of the third book. Psalms 84 through 89 then finish up the Levitical book. It's a short book. But Asaph is a prophet. And Asaph's desire is seen clearly in Psalm 73, verse 17, which we went over last week, but we'll look at 73, 16. But when I thought how to understand these things. And the things that that Asaph is trying to understand in the 73rd Psalm is, why do the wicked prosper? See, that's the fundamental problem of holiness. Am I living my life for the holiness of God, in the holiness of God, striving to be sanctified, and the wicked still prosper? And remember, Psalm 82 says that the definition of wickedness, the lawless ones, are those who remove justice from the earth. That's wickedness. You want to describe who's wicked and, and, and who's righteous according to Psalm 1, which is where all the Psalms begin. It's telling us the rest of the Psalms is simply a treatise on how to be righteous and, and forsake wickedness. But if you want to judge it, it's those who remove justice from the land, from the nation, from the church, from the nations of the earth. He, he can't understand why is this happening. Verse 16 of Psalm 73, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. See, all life needs to be oriented around standing in the sanctuary, the holy place of God, looking at his otherness. To stand in the sanctuary, is it's where Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train fills the temple. It's where Ezekiel sees the, the, the chariot of God borne by the, by the cherubim and the ophanim, these, these, these heavenly beings, and, and Ezekiel has an encounter with God. To stand in the sanctuary is the book of Revelation, to be caught up to heaven and see the Lamb on the throne, the Lord Jesus Christ, determining the course of human history based on his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. We need to stand in the sanctuary. And this is where Asaph begins. But may I say there are 11 consecutive Psalms, 73 through 83. I've read 82 already. Jan read 83 at the start. God is not silent. God is working behind the scenes to destroy the enemies who would seek to destroy the church, who would seek to destroy God's people. Uh, as as I, one of my comments, uh, again, five months ago, when I, I commented on Psalm 83, this is what I said about Psalm 83. God is silent, right? No, he's working behind the scenes, as Jan said, to destroy the enemies that are seeking to destroy the church. I will build my church. The gates of Hades, the gates of death, shall not prevail against her. Even in his silence, God is speaking. As Psalm 83 describes, while he's not speaking, he continues doing. And what he is doing is making war with our enemies. This is my comment. Next time you don't hear the Lord and ask him why he's not speaking, Listen closely, and you might hear him say, I can't talk now. I'm too busy defeating your enemies. Then repent and give thanks. So 73 to 83 are these Psalms of Asaph. They are prophetic Psalms. Remember, book number one, 
the first Davidic Psalter, book number one, the first section of the Psalms is about the kingship of David. Book two, the second Davidic Psalter, Psalm 51 through 72, which we spent the last three weeks looking at. That's talking about the reign of Solomon. Book three, which is also the Levitical book, the holiness book, it's the book of the divided kingdom. It's when Israel and Judah separate. And see, when God's people are in division, we need more than ever the prophetic voice to rise up. And that's why the book that begins with Israel being divided the kingdom being divided when, 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 when Jeroboam took the 10 northern tribes and Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, took the two southern tribes and they became separate nations. The church needs a true prophetic voice more than ever when the church is divided. And they don't need prophetic voices that further divide the church, which is what we're hearing all about right now. Join this political party. Join this perspective. Oh, and our political perspective is right and yours isn't. We don't need that kind of prophecy right now. That's false prophecy. That's prophecy that divides. We need prophecy that unifies. So when the second Davidic Psalter ends with us, the psalm directed towards Solomon in, in Psalm 72 and Psalm 73 begins with Asaph now 11 consecutive psalms. It's saying we need a prophet. We need a prophet to speak to us when we're divided. Now go over with me to Psalm 78. I, I, just, I just want you to see that Asaph is a prophet. He's just as legitimate of a prophet as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. He's just as legitimate of a prophet. This is what, how Psalm 78 begins. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell it to the coming generation, the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Now, something, this, this is Asaph defining his prophetic role in these 11 Psalms. And actually there's a 12th where we started the second Davidic Psalter. The second Davidic Psalter that actually runs Psalm 51 through 72 is preceded by the only other Psalm of Asaph. Psalm 50 was the only other psalm of Asaph. We'll, we'll, we'll check into that in a moment. But if you remember, the Psalm 50 was the Lord calls heaven and earth into his heavenly courtroom, just like Psalm 82. God's going to deal with the, with, with the earth, the created order, the universe. And he, he summons heaven and earth, and he summons all of his people into the throne room of his judgment, where he renders just and righteous decisions and he says, there are godly among my people, there are wicked among my people. And he calls the godly to continue to walk in their godliness. And he calls the wicked among his people to repent. That's the beauty of God's courtroom. He doesn't call us in to say, you're righteous, be blessed, you're unrighteous, off with your heads. Those who are unrighteous have a chance to repent. Asaph speaks prophetically before we go into the second Davidic Psalter, the first Davidic Psalter in the first book of the Psalms. The first Davidic Psalter, Psalm 1 through 41, talks about the establishment of David's kingship. The second Davidic Psalter in book 2, primarily Psalms 51 through 72, speak of how God, once he establishes David's kingship, how he sustains his kingship. But before he talks about sustaining, again, a prophet speaks. Prophets speak to establish true lordship and rulership in the church. Prophets speak when times of division hinder the true lordship and the authority. Now, I spoke when we started this series some months back 
started this series on the, the, the nature of, the true nature of prophetic ministry in the church. We said that prophets don't just prophesy. What prophets do is they interpret the history of God's people. They interpret history and they look back at scripture. They don't just come up with novel words and ideas that fit their own perceptions of the current times. They can speak words into the current times, but there is this foundation of history. The Psalms lay out an eschatological scheme for God's people to understand how God implements his kingdom purposes in the earth, and he does it with history. Asaph is very interested in history. He's, Psalm 78, one of the longest psalms in the Psalter, deals with Israel's history. He talks about how God is going to deal with Israel now, a divided kingdom, a divided nation, based on how he acted previously. See, that's, that's, that's what's missing in this whole debate right now. You hear a lot of people, their dreams and their visions and Jesus appears in their bedrooms and, you know, Jesus goes with them on when they go for walks with their dogs. But, you know, there's a prophetic pattern established in history. The history of Israel, the history of Jesus in the Gospels, the history of the church in Acts, the prophetic foreshadowed history in the book of Revelation. By the way, the book of Revelation, which is talking about the future for the church, guess what's, what it's all based on? No book in the New Testament more allusions to the Old Testament than the book of Revelation. What God is doing now is based on what God did then. And see, that's the uniqueness of Asaph. He is going to utter dark sayings of old. He's going he's to remind Israel of their history and say, see how God worked. See what God was saying then. Now base your judgment, your prophetic understanding, your faith, your hope, your love on what God did then and watch him repeat it now. Now this is very interesting about Psalm 78. Watch where that psalm is quoted in the New Testament. Keep your hand in Psalm 78 and just go with me to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, Jesus is speaking the parables of the kingdom. Now, Jesus speaks in parables in Matthew 13. He says he speaks in parables because some understand and some don't. And the only way you can understand Jesus' parables is Guess what? If you're obedient to him, if you're walking in, in the power of the scripture. And he starts with the parable of the sower and the seeds. Uh, he starts with that in um, verse 18 of Matthew 13. And he deals with these things publicly and then he stops dealing with them publicly and then he deals with his disciples, the rest of the, of the parables privately. <clears throat> and here's what he says when he stops. This is, this is what he says when he stops his public exposition of the parables. Matthew 13, 34. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. And he quotes Psalm 78. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Two, two things I want to point here. He calls Asaph the prophet. And second, second, he says, if you're really going to understand the parables that I give, you have to understand history, biblical history, divine history. You have to understand it. And if you don't, you won't understand his parables. And by the way, all of life is a parable. Do, do you understand that everything that God does in your life is a parable? It's a, it's a story in which he's trying to show you how he works in your life, in other people's lives, in the church, in the nations of the earth. So pay attention to what God does in your life. 
it's a parable. And when you figure out the meaning of the parable, and you will figure it out by studying history, biblical history, the written word, not, you know, um, how many dreams and how many visions and how many prophetic words can the Lord give me. Those are legitimate. Those are valid. But not in any way, shape, or form to take from the word. Now, on our way back to Psalm 74, stop at Psalm 50. I said 50 was the first psalm by Asaph. It's the it's the it's the first psalm by Asaph. I, I notice here my uh, my phone is dinging, which means I didn't put it on the silent mode. It is on the silent mode. Thank you, Jesus. Look at Psalm 50. This is where the Lord calls uh, every one of his people into his throne room of judgment. And in that throne room of judgment, uh, what he begins to do is gather his people together for his rendering of justice in their lives and in their midst. But look how it starts. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Psalm 50, verse 1. Psalm 50, verse 2. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes. He does not keep silence. As Psalm 83, which ends all of Asaph's. Why are you silent? Oh, wait a second. You're not silent, Lord. You brought us into the throne room of your judgment back in Psalm 50, another Psalm of Asaph. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest. That's a picture of Daniel 7, the throne room of God's judgment, the, the scripture par excellence uh, that shows us what it means to come into the heavenly counsel of the Lord. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones. See, they're my righteous ones, my faithful ones, those who keep covenant with me, those who walk in truth, those who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. And then he, he Asaph is actually, this is a prophecy. It's, it's God himself speaking through the prophet Asaph. It's a thus saith the Lord. And it continues, hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you in court. Covenant lawsuit in court is what the Hebrew says. I am God, your God. And then in verse 22, you know, the Lord goes through and he, and he, he exhorts the faithful to remain faithful and the wicked to repent and change their ways. And the Lord says, mark this then you who do what? Forget God. How do we forget God? When we forget history. That's how you forget God. Not just your personal history. I mean, that's part of it. To, to never forget God's brought you thus far. When you say tomorrow, why is this happening to me? Well, remember what God has done in your life up to yesterday. We do remember God, but we cannot forget history. God has proven himself to be a faithful God way, way, way before we were born. And he will continue to prove that way, way, way after we're gone. Mark this then, you who forget God, lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To the one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. And remember, thanksgiving, there, there are two things that the Lord demands of us to walk in faithfulness. First, thanksgiving. And thanksgiving, the Hebrew word todah, it has a dual meaning in the Hebrew. It means, thanksgiving means to give thanks to the Lord for the wonderful, righteous, gracious things that he's done. But it also means to confess our sin. The same word for to give thanksgiving to God is to confess our sin. And see, there's, this is what God really demands of us. We live in reality. Living in reality is we see him the way he is and that will cause us to give thanksgiving and we see ourselves the way we are and that will cause us to confess our sin. Oh, isn't there a place there for accusing our brothers and sisters who didn't vote the way we did? There's not. Sorry, 
That one's not there. That one is a work of division, not a work of righteousness. Now, if we go back to the Psalms of Asaph, and the one um, that I would like to go to right now, first of all, is Psalm 77. All of these Psalms have some very important aspects of how God establishes holiness. If I have time at the end uh, of this message to, to do a brief summary, I will, but there are some, some issues that I really want you to see. Psalm 77. Now, Psalm 77, 13 deals with holiness. Psalm 77, 13, your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God. Just as, as Asaph said in Psalm 50, we give thanksgiving and we walk in the uprightness of his way. We order our lives according to his uprightness. Well, this is holiness, the holiness of God. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God. Now, in the midst of establishing that God is faithful and it is God's faithfulness, God's holiness, God's faithfulness to fulfill his promises that establishes holiness in us. When we see him as faithful, we get transformed. We see him as he is. We become like him. Notice three times what Asaph says in Psalm 77. Verse three, when I remember God, I moan. Verse six, I said, let me remember my song in the night. Verse 11, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. See, it's do not forget. We need to constantly remember this. We need to constantly remember this. Now look what else he says in those same verses. Back to verse three, when I remember God, I moan, but we do something else besides remembering. We remember and we meditate. Meditate means to consider in our heart and our mind, we turn it over and over and over. The Hebrew word for meditate, we were taught this many years ago, is, is similar to a cow chewing the cud. It's we, we, we regurgitate, if you will, some of that f undigested food and we chew on it and we stay nourished. So we are to remember, and then what we remember, we're to meditate, we're to consider it, we're to focus on it, we're to let it immerse our hearts and minds and our souls. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. Back again uh, in verse 6, I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. And the diligent search comes up with this as we're remembering and then we're meditating and searching out divine history, how God has acted in the past. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Now we know chesed, the steadfast love, is a main concern of, in the Psalms. In the 150 Psalms, the word chesed is used more in those 150 Psalms than chesed is used in the rest of the Old Testament. Chesed is, is the equivalent of the New Testament grace of God. It's, the, it's God's steadfast love is the New Testament, Old Testament equivalent to the New Testament concept of God's agape love. God's grace and agape love in the New Testament spoken of as his chesed. Now, we saw chesed 54 times in book one and book two. We're going to see it 60 times in book five. Book five has more references to chesed, the steadfast love of the Lord. As we conclude the Psalter, we move from how do we distinguish between righteousness and wickedness of Psalm one, and we end up with praising God for his steadfast love in the, the, the final Psalms, of the Psalter because it is his steadfast love, his chesed, his faithfulness to his promises, his love toward us, his delivering us, delivering us from our enemies that establishes true righteousness and frees us from true wickedness. But Asaph isn't very concerned with chesed. In the 12 Psalms that he names only once 
does he mention it, and that's here. Will the Lord spurn forever, verse 7, and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? This is the diligent search that Asaph is making in his spirit and then prophesying to God's people. Then I said, Excuse me, verse 9. Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? And by the way, that is a, a direct reference to Exodus 34, 6. Remember when the Lord said, Moses, I'm going to appear before you and I'm going to proclaim my name to you. And what does he proclaim? He's the God who exercises steadfast love. He's the God of grace. He's the God of compassion. He's the God who fulfills his covenant promises to his people. So what Asaph is saying is, as I'm meditating on the works of the Lord, oh yeah, Psalm 34, verse 6 comes to my mind. How did God deal with his people as he was taking them out of Egypt through the wilderness and into the promised land? His steadfast love prevailed. God's people, well, their performance was not very good in the wilderness, but God had the final say. And whether our performance is is been very good in America, I would be one to say no. As my brothers and sisters of color remind us, they call this COVID-16-19, not COVID-19, and it's a reminder of when slavery started in this nation. No, America hasn't. It's violence, extermination of the original peoples, it's, it's racism, it's favoring of the rich and the wealthy at the expense of the poor, it's violence, it's oppression. No, America hasn't done the greatest of jobs, but neither did Israel, and God was there to deliver them. I would just, this is just a suggestion. It's not a prophetic word, because I don't really know what's coming tomorrow. Here's a suggestion, those who are afraid this country's gonna be destroyed. Well, how about thinking that God works on behalf of his people and when he hears his people's prayers, he delivers them. So let's pray for this nation. Let's pray for each other. Let's pray for justice. Let's pray for righteousness. Let's pray for truth. And let's kind of step back and see what God does. Let's continue to proclaim the truth. People ask me, well, what is your plan in the midst of all this, this horror that's, that's going on in our country or about to take place? And of course, the horrors are different depending on you know, which candidate you voted for. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to continue to make disciples, as the Great Commission said. Make disciples in good times. Make disciples in bad times. Make disciples when this threat threatens us. Make disciples if you think America is the greatest nation on the earth. Make disciples if you think America is the worst nation on earth. Make disciples whichever ruler or leader or party has political authority in the country. Make disciples. And you make disciples by teaching them to proclaim the gospel teaching them to live the gospel, and teaching them to bring others into discipleship in the gospel. So that's what I'm going to do. And woe unto me if I don't. That's what Paul said. Woe unto me if, 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 if my circumstances that I'm living in stop me from proclaiming the sacred trust that the Lord has given to me. So as the psalmist, as Asaph is thinking about Exodus 34, then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. Third time he says, remember, and third time he says in the next verse, and I will meditate upon all your work. I will ponder, I will, con I will consider, I will consider all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. And that leads us to your way is holy. What God is great like our God. And then what does he do? He goes to the Exodus 
and describes all the things that happened in the Exodus. He says, remember, remember what God did uh, for his people uh, back in the Exodus when he brought us through the Red Sea? And I love the way he says this. Your way was through the sea in verse 19. Your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You know, after God did everything he did with the Red Sea, the Red Sea just went back to being the Red Sea. You can go to the Red Sea today and it's just a natural phenomenon. But see, when God stepped through, he interrupted human history when he came down from heaven. That's his righteousness. That's his faithfulness. That's his steadfast love. And Asaph says, remember even in the divided kingdom, remember in troubled times in America, what God hath wrought. What God has done. Right, here's an interesting thing. That's how God brings us into his holiness. He, he, he moves on our behalf and shows he's faithful. And that's how we become like him. But notice where it closes too. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Where is the shepherd of Israel? Well, he was there then and, and, and he'll be there again. But notice at the end of this psalm, he talks about God shepherding his people by means of raising up righteous leaders. See, Moses represents the apostolic. Aaron represents the, the, the teaching ministry, apostles and teachers. Miriam, not mentioned at this point, represents the prophetic. And part of God's plan for holiness, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, but authentic ones. Scripture talks about false apostles, false teachers, talks about false prophets. It actually talks about false pastors because who, who, who were the pastors of Israel? The king was the pastor. The king was the shepherd of Israel. False leaders, false political leaders, false shepherds. The only thing I haven't seen yet is a false evangelist because evangelists are always bringing good news. And when you bring the good news of the gospel, well, that it's kind of like a, a, a fail-safe device. Hallelujah. But we need in this hour, as God moves, he needs to raise up men and women who will sanctify themselves before the people. In other words, will set them apart and they will set themselves apart and not represent their own agendas, but represent the agenda of the Lord. So we have 73. We have... In 74, the, the, the temple is destroyed. So, uh, Psalm 74 speaks of the destruction of the temple. The division that separated Israel and Judah eventually led to the destruction of the temple. Assyria destroyed the 10 northern tribes, and 135 years later, Judah, Benjamin, the, the nation of Judah, the southern tribes were destroyed by Babylon and the temple was destroyed. And that's why Asaph starts out with reminding, division leads to destruction of the church and the temple. When there's division in the house, where does God's holy presence dwell? Come together, church. Forget about who voted for whom. Whoever ends up being president, pray. Pray for that president, which we're called to do. I, I, I had a wise brother who exhorted his church when Trump became president. And he was, he was talking about a church. He, he, had a, he had a mixed church. Mixed churches... Uh, in, in my neck of the woods aren't white and black, it's Republican and Democrat. That's, that's a mixed church. Uh, different ethnic groups, different tribes. He reminded those who were now declaring how great President Trump was, they simply said, he said, now, if you didn't pray for President Obama for the last eight years, don't, don't, don't tell me how great President Trump is. You can't really even pray for Trump because you're a, that'll make you a hypocrite. That was a powerful word. I remembered that at the start. I said, I'm praying for all the presidents. 
But in the midst of this, the church has to come together, Psalm 74, O oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pastor? Where is the shepherd? See, that's going to be a common theme in Asaph's psalm. Where's the shepherd? Why do you cast us off? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your inheritance. Remember Mount Zion, where you have dwelt. Now, 75 is powerful because what 75 does is when Asaph says the temple's destroyed, what are we to do? 75 is the answer. To the choir master, according to do not destroy, a psalm of Asaph. We've, we saw do not destroy three times in the second Psalter. Psalm 57, God's people are not called to destroy their enemies. When David had the chance to kill Saul in the cave and Saul was pursuing David, David didn't do it. The psalm relating to that, Psalm 57, do not destroy. Psalm 58 is, nations of the world do not destroy justice. That's exactly what Psalm 82 is talking about. It just doesn't say do not destroy. We're not to, we're not to see justice destroyed. We're to pray for our governments and our politicians and our, our branches of government and our leaders not to destroy justice. And then Psalm 59, again, is do not destroy. And that's where Saul went after David. And the, the idea is, Lord, don't let the leaders and the rulers of your people for their own agendas destroy those who disagree with them. Don't let the church destroy the church. We're not called to destroy our enemies. We can't afford to have justice destroyed and removed from our nation. And we can't destroy one another. So, so what are we not to destroy here? Well, the Lord allowed Assyria and Babylon to come in and destroy the 10 northern tribes, destroy Judah, destroy the temple. So Asaph has the next psalm. When we see God's judgment, please, Lord, don't let the judgment that you release in the earth destroy your people. Now it's a cry to God. What are you going to do, Lord, when your people are divided and there's destruction that is birthed from their division? Well, let's look at it. Do not destroy it. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. What this psalm is going to be is this this is what God does when his people cry out, Lord, the judgment that's coming forth on this nation, the judgment that's coming forth in the earth, don't, don't let it destroy your people. The divine warrior rises up. The divine warrior rises up. And actually, Psalm 75, which looks like, in most of our translations, descriptions of what God is doing are actually one divine name after another. What we read, and ESV says, we give thanks to you, O God, we give thanks for your name is near, we recount all of your wondrous deeds. What, this, what it actually says in the Hebrew is, we give thanks to you, O God, we give thanks for your name is the famous one. This is going to be all, it's just that the divine warrior is going to come up. The famous one, the one of renown is going to come forth and rise up against the enemies of God's people. He's going to reveal who he is and what his heart is toward us. And he's going to destroy our enemies and bring the church, bring his people back into unity where he can rebuild the temple. So the first name of God that we see in verse one is your name is the famous one. Then we go to verse four. Verse four, I say to the boastful, do not boast. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horn. You know what? I'm, 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 I'm in Psalm 75 and I need to go to Psalm 76. I'm, I'm, I'm reading Psalm, I'm, I'm quoting to you Psalm 75 when I should be reading Psalm 76. The point of Psalm 75, the do not destroy, is that the Lord gathers us and restores us according to his purposes and then the divine warrior rises up. Okay, 
do not destroy, I'm reading the notes for Psalm 76, to my embarrassment, toward Psalm 75, I have just I have too many notes here in front of me at this point. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. At the set time that I appoint, the Lord says, I will judge with equity. When the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who keep steady its pillars. So 75 is leading us to 76, where the divine warrior will come up and implement all of these things. But 75 The Lord is gathering us and restoring us. And the key verse is verse two. At the set time that I appoint, I will judge with equity. Now the set time in Hebrew is moed. And in Hebrew, moed can mean the appointed time. It can mean the appointed place. The uh, the sanctuary was called the ohel moed. It was the place where God appointed his purposes to emanate from. That's the, the temple. But the same word for, the, for, the, for this set place, this appointed place, could also be the appointed time. And the appointed time, it also could be used for the appointed feast. Now remember that the Jews, every year, they did Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. See, there's history. The Lord is teaching his people. He's ingraining his people with history. We need to keep rehearsing what God has done. Passover, he delivers his people. Pentecost, he pours out his spirit. He gives them the law. He gives them the word. Pentecost in the Old Testament is the giving of the law at Sinai. In the New Testament, it's the outpouring of the spirit delivers us from Egypt, gives us his law, and then tabernacles is, and he brings us into the land and defeats our enemies. See, it's this constant rehearsal, this constant rehearsal of divine time, divine history that works into us his eschatological purposes and gives us hope. Now, now we get to the divine warrior in 76. So the divine warrior rises up and now we're gonna see the heavenly warrior coming to defend his people and reveal who he is and his heart toward us. And this is how he performs his holiness, how he sanctifies us, how he makes us holy. And this is what he does when you have a divided nation. Notice how 76 begins. In Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. He's interested in Israel and Judah being one. Ezekiel. In in Ezekiel 37, after he sees the dead bones rise, he gets two sticks. One is the stick for Judah. One is the stick for Joseph and Ephraim. Joseph and Ephraim is Israel, the 10 northern tribes. Judah represents the two southern tribes. And make the two sticks one in your hands. True prophetic work, true apostolic work in this hour is going to be bringing unity to the body of Christ. Israel is a divided nation, so in Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. Now, that's where it says in the Hebrew. In Judah, God is the famous one. God is the renowned one. His name is great in Israel. If we drop down to verse 4, ESV says, Glorious are you, more majestic than the mountains of prey. There's a Tip of the hat to hunters, the mountains where there's abundant wildlife for hunting. But where where our translations make it sound like it's something God does, glorious are you, more majestic than the mountains of prey, the Hebrew says, you are the glorious one. You are the majestic one. You are the resplendent one. So the famous one, comes forth as a divine warrior. The glorious and majestic one comes forth as a divine warrior. Verse six, they get it right. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both rider and horse lay stunned. The God of Jacob is the God who Jacob the conniver still gets the inheritance because God breaks him and gives him a new name, Israel. The God of Jacob is coming in our midst. Verse seven, But you, you are to be feared. You are the awesome one, Hebrews says. But you, 
You are the awesome one in Hebrew. Who can stand before you when once your anger is roused? The famous one, the glorious one, the majestic one, the God of Jacob, the awesome one. And verse 11, make your vows to Yahweh your God and perform them. Let all around him bring gifts to him who is, once again, the awesome one. So he's the Lord God. He's Yahweh your God. He's the, the awesome one. He's the fearsome one who cuts off the spirit of princes who is to be feared by the kings of the earth. So how will God deal with our rebellion? He will deal with our rebellion by manifesting himself. Now we get to 77 which we, we looked at. And we said 77 ended with the words, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses. Where's the shepherd? He's leading them by revealing himself to them. He's leading them by delivering them. He's leading them by justice. He's leading them by bringing them into the sanctuary. The shepherd is not missing. The shepherd is here to shepherd his sheep. 78. 78 is, as I said, one of the longest psalms, and 78 deals with God's election, God's choice. Now, I want you to look at three verses in, in this psalm. Actually, I want you to look at, at more than three verses. It's interesting. As verse 5 of 78 says, the Lord established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers to teach their children this rehearsal of history. And the first thing he comes up with is verse 9. The Ephraimites, now Ephraim, Joseph, that's the northern tribes, the ten northern tribes, not the two southern tribes of Judah. The Ephraimites, verse 9, armed with the bow, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law. They forgot his words and the wonders that he had shown them. First of all, the Lord judges the 10 northern tribes. See, see, when there's division in God's people between Israel and Judah, somebody's right and somebody's wrong. Here's what happened with Israel. Even though God gave the 10 northern tribes to Jeroboam, and, and he was supposed to rule those, and he took, he, the Lord caused that division because of abuse of authority by Solomon and Rehoboam. They both abused the 10 northern tribes and favored the two southern tribes. Heavy taxation of the north for the benefit of the south. Hmm, sounds like some political issues we have today going on in America. When we rob from one and benefit only our tribe, we are not walking in justice. God separated the tribes and said, okay, now work this thing out. I separated because you're abusing power, Solomon. Now, Jeroboam, I'm giving you the 10 northern tribes. Don't abuse your power. You know what? The temple was still in Jerusalem. All of God's people, whether they were Israel or Judah, Democrats or Republicans, they were all still supposed to worship where God had set his name in Jerusalem. But what did Jeroboam do? He made, a, 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 he made separate sanctuaries in Dan and Bethel for the people to worship there. He did, was afraid that if they went up to worship in Jerusalem, that they would turn their hearts from him. And see, that's where leaders go wrong. That's abuse of power. And remember, we said there are three things that real prophets do. Real prophets prophesy. Real prophets base their understanding of God's purposes on history. And third, they deal with abuses of power. Jeroboam was more interested in consolidating his power than performing God's work. There is a judgment on leaders and political parties and leaders in the church who, again, make everything revolve around what's good for me and mine. How do I consolidate my power? That's not justice. 
So Ephraim, the 10 northern tribes, are disqualified because they weren't faithful to God's covenant. So this is about disqualification and qualification. Look at verse, uh, chapter, uh, verse 41. Psalm 78, 40. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness. They grieved him in the desert. They tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. Ephraim is not faithful. God's people in the wilderness are not faithful. We go over to verse 54. He brought them to his holy land, to the mountain, which his right-handed one, they're still not faithful. They're resisting the process of holiness. And that brings us to 67. He rejected the tent of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loves. He built his sanctuary like the high heavens, like the earth, which he has founded forever. He chose David, his servant, took him from the sheepfolds, from following the nursing ewes, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people. Israel is inheritance. Where's the shepherd? Well, I established godly leaders. Moses, Miriam, Levi in the previous psalm, David in this psalm. See, God rejects those who are not men and women after his own heart. There is still, and this issue in the division of the church, there are those who are Ephraimatic, Ephraimites, Ephraimatic leaders who are leading God's people astray. They're like Jeroboam, and they just, they're, they're, they're worried about their own reputation. They're worried about consolidating power for themselves. They are disqualified. And you have to understand, in a in division in the church, what God is looking for is where are the Davidic leaders? They're the ones that are chosen, and there are some that are disqualified. With an upright heart, David shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. So there's God elects, God chooses, and he, the way he does this is in the midst of division, there have to be legitimate prophetic voice and legitimate leaders. I'm running out of time here. Psalm 79. O God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They've laid Jerusalem in ruins. Now, even after, now this is, this is the paradox, but we got to close with making this point. This point is very important and we'll close. Asaph is out laying out Israelite history to show how God accomplishes his purposes. He chooses righteous leaders over unrighteous leaders, but even righteous leaders, even Davidic leader shepherding the flock of God's people, they're still not enough because, again, Psalm 79 reminds that, yeah, but yes, Judah, in spite of the fact that David was leading them, they went bad too. And 135 years after the Lord judged Ephraim, he judged Judah. Both nations went in exile because ultimately the only way for God's church to function correctly and righteously is in unity. And again, how long, O Lord, verse five, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Verse nine, help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us, make atonement for our sins for your name's sake. And then verse 13 continues the question, but we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever from generation to generation. We will recount your praise. And then Psalm 80 begins, Begin, o sh give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. We go full circle. Division ultimately destroys the temple. God will rise up. He will establish righteous leaders and point out unrighteous leaders. This, we're going to see Everybody who's claiming to hear from it, we are going to see in this hour who has spoken for the Lord and who has not spoken. God, God set it in motion. 
If you want to understand what we're, what's happening right now, these, these dark sayings, these parables, we're in a parable right now. COVID, civil disruption, economic disaster, the country on the verge of splitting apart. Oh, the Lord has set this up. He's going to show who speaks for the Lord and who doesn't. So there will be a Davidic endorsement and there will be the Ephraimites. The Lord will say, no, they have not spoken for the Lord. However, even after all of this takes place, if we only have Judah and Davidic leaders, if there's just this small remnant of those who out there are speaking the truth, he reminds us again, the temple is still destroyed even with a righteous Davidic line. And that leads us to 80. And we're, I guess we'll close with 80. 80. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. And then here's something amazing. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come and save us. Wait, wait a second, you disqualified Ephraim and Manasseh. Now you're saying Ephraim, Ben. The Lord's ultimate purpose is even the part of the body that he rejects and the part of the body that he chooses. The part of the body he chooses is not sufficient without the part of the body that's rejected. We need all of us together. We need Dr. King and his understanding of justice for the poor and the broken and the vulnerable. We need Sanctity of Life Human Sunday, standing up for justice for the unborn. We need all the church to come together. And remember how Psalm 50 started, where the Asaph Psalm starts, Arise, O Lord, and shine. Shine forth your glory. Verse 2 before of, of 80. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might, come and save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Verse 7. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Verse 19. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. He needs all of us. He needs Ephraim. He needs Judah. He needs those on this side of the argument, those on that side of the argument. Please beware those of you who are demonizing your brothers and sisters because they didn't vote like you voted. God needs the whole body. And notice three times, restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. Each restoration, it's recited three times, but they're three different names of God. Restore us, verse three. God, verse seven, restore us, God of armies. And, and the heavenly host calls me God of, the, God of the heavenly council, the 24 elders, justice. And the final restoration, restore us, Yahweh, God of hosts. There's, a, there's this, this increasing revelation of who he is as his names are being revealed to us. Lord, reveal your name to Democrats, reveal your name to Republicans, reveal your name to those who voted for Trump and those who voted for Biden and those who didn't vote at all, reveal your name. Reveal your name to, to those who are so worried that the left is gonna take over. Reveal your name to those who wanna punish the right for its sin. Reveal your name, Lord, to those who say, can't we just walk in the gospel? Reveal your name, O oh God. Shine, O oh Lord, reveal your name and cause your church to come together in this hour. Divine warrior, all your mighty names come in our midst in Jesus' name. And Lord, I say a special prayer for Lord of the Harvest. We have tried and we have tried and we have tried. We've brought together men and women. We have brought together young and old. We've brought together black and white. We've brought together middle class and poor. We've brought together Democrats and Republicans and, and we were able to bring them together, but we have not been able to sustain 
and to move forward. There is still division in Lord of the Harvest. There is division among the leaders. There is division among the members in this church. And I just, for Lord of the Harvest, I pray, oh God, and let these prayers that we are praying for the church in the earth, for the church in this nation, please let them come to pass at Lord of the Harvest. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. I went crazy. God bless you. Thanks for for all the time. Amen.